Okay, now that we have recording in progress, I want to reintroduce Jeff Miller, who is the president of the Fox Valley Electric Auto Association, who is this month's featured speaker to present to us the, um, the an update on the IRA and electric vehicles, uh, and hopefully opportunities we can all take advantage of in the coming years. So Jeff Miller, take it away. Fantastic. Uh, you can see my screen and hear me all right? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Federal. So I am actually going to cover both the federal and the Illinois EV incentives because we actually have a fairly generous uh, local incentive here in the state of Illinois from the CJA Act. So uh, we would be remiss to not talk about that, at least briefly. Uh, let's see if I can remember how to use a computer. Ah, there we go. Okay, so the Illinois EV rebate, um, it's $4,000, which is, again, pretty generous. And you can get it today and you can get it on cars that aren't currently eligible for the um, federal money. So if you wanted to, if you need to buy a car before the end of the year, um, there's an opportunity here to get $4,000 on that vehicle. Um, you know, if the, and if that happens to qualify for the federal money also, you can even, you know, obviously add on to that with the federal money too. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and this also qualifies for used vehicles which the federal does too, to some degree, but uh, yeah, so it's something to look into. I've got um, some links I'll put up in the chat. And I'll do that at the end. At the end, I'll put links into the chat for all the different programs, if that sounds reasonable to everyone. Okay, uh, for how to apply and all of that. But uh, key elements here are, it is a limited pool of money. When they allocated the money to CJA, we were surprised at a relatively small amount but we are expecting it to be enough to at least carry us through this next quarter, this current quarter that they're in. The current quarter ends in January, the end of January. So you may need to make sure your applications are postmarked by the end of January for the $4,000. Um, every quarter that goes by, the money gets less, you know, money dwindles, right? Um, and there's priority for people who make less money than the average income or median income. So. And it's something like 80,000 for the family, give or take. I don't have the exact number, but if you think you might qualify for that, then you would want to include the additional addendums to your application to get that. Okay, uh, any questions about the Illinois EV program rebates? You said that after um, January, it, it begins to dwindle. Does that mean the 4,000 or that's just the pool dwindles? The pool, well, so yeah, the, the pool is a fixed amount of money and we don't know how fast it's disappearing. So the question is, is will it last through the first two quarters or the first three quarters or okay. the first one quarter? <laughs> we don't know the answer to that question. So my thinking is, is if you want to take advantage of that, do so, you know, before the end of January 31st, the first quarter is already closed. Um, and, but I haven't heard results from that. People who applied in the first quarter, I don't know if they've gotten paid or not. I haven't heard from anybody if, if they've gotten it or not. Um, so, you know, they're probably still doing the paperwork and evaluating all the applications and everything because, they're, again, there is a variety of paperwork has to be submitted. So it's, a, it's an extensive process, of course, because, you know, we love our bureaucracy here in the state of Illinois, which is fine. But uh, that's just the way it works. Okay. Uh, any other questions about that? Or All right. We'll move along. Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, this has been big news. A lot of you have probably heard about this before. So, but I'm just kind of generally covering the general highlights here. Um, but the one, of course, that we're going to be talking about here is build more EV parts and vehicles in North America. And the key here is in North America. Um, you can, you'll see that throughout this, when we're going through this legislation. It, it, it also, you know, it'll touch on what we will see will kind of impact some of these other things, right? Lowering energy costs and all that, decarbonizing the economy, obviously, right? But, you know, what we're going to be looking at is the vehicles. And obviously vehicles, as you know, touch everything else. All right, uh, high level, so there are currently tax credits, um, just like before. So it's a, a, the Illinois is a rebate, so it'll cut you a check, right? So you get your $4,000 check. The, the federal, this 2022 and 2023 is a tax credit. Um, in 2024 and beyond, new dealers can apply for new cars to actually have the credit be a point of sale item. I don't know what that process looks like. They put it out into 2024 to give them time to figure all that out because I'm sure it's gonna be complicated because the dealers have to apply and there's a lot of paperwork for them to do, I assume. 
they're going to get pre-funded with a bunch of money and it, you know how these things go it's it's a it's a lot of bureaucracy to get that all spun up and the government can't do that on, on you know in a week or a month so that's kind of how that works the used cars are going to stay a tax credit because they don't want to spin that up for all the used car dealers in the world which are substantial um okay yep and income limits do apply unlike the old ev tax credits where it was wide open to anybody who made any amount of money um this is very much very much focused on helping people that make less money now it's still reasonable but <laughs> you know we'll talk about that as we go through it okay starting out with the uh, used ones so 30 percent of the sale price or four thousand dollars whichever is less all right and here's the income limits so modified adjusted gross income and then that's um filing jointly head of household and then lastly file single filer right so um you know if you're exceeding those numbers and that's for magi and if you don't know what magi is it's basically your adjusted gross income with some things added back in so your adjusted gross income is down right from your gross income right so this adds a few things back in um quite a few different tax credits use magi but it's not something you'll see on your tax form it's actually something you have to like take the number off your tax form and then like go back calculate it if you have questions if you're close to these numbers i would recommend talking to your accountant when you're doing your taxes or asking your accountant um, to figure out how that falls for you because if you're close you'll need to understand where you're at on that okay and again, that, that's lower for used cars. Uh, new cars, it'll be a higher number. Okay, the car itself must be two model years old. So in, that, in other words, in 2023, it has to be at least a 2021 or older, right? So they don't want you buying a car and flipping it six months later and that person getting it. Um, sale, yeah, sale price under 25,000, okay? So that's where you can see that 30% or $4,000 starts getting close because it has to be relatively inexpensive. It has to be from a dealer. It cannot be a private party transaction. And it and the, the bit I really dislike is it has to be the first sale on that car. So the car is only eligible once. <laughs> and the Illinois has a sim similar provision in it, right? So how do I know if that car has gotten it before? Uh, I hate that provision. I, I really do, because from a logistic standpoint, understanding what is going to happen when I buy a car, I don't like that. Um, it makes it confusing and difficult to understand. And it has to be from a dealer. So, you know, the dealers may tell you it's fine and it's not, right? You don't know. And uh, that, that, I really don't like that. I hope that they have some system, a VIN lookup system, or some way of being able to determine this. But as you know, they have not published a system like that, nor have they published a 2023 list of cars. We'll get into that in a minute. Okay, this is just a general general guideline. Um, if you know anybody or if you operate a business or know anybody who does operate a business that has large commercial vehicles, garbage trucks or school buses or any dump trucks or concrete trucks or anything. You know anybody who runs a business like that or if you run a business like that that operates commercial vehicles, you can get up to $40,000 for these large commercial vehicles, okay? Um, I'm not an accountant, I'm not gonna go into the details, but it's definitely in there and it is a pretty generous amount of money. So reach out to your friends and family members, neighbors, whoever you know that's operating vehicle, fleets of vehicles and see if you can get them to move over or at least put a bug in the various manufacturers' ears that they want to take advantage of this $40,000, <laughs> right? So get those folks uh, warmed up to this idea, because hey. Okay. So Jeff, th that would apply probably to you know, things like, you know, uh, school buses, correct? I mean, uh, you know, I know there's probably going to be a growing, you know, availability of, of commercial, but school buses would probably fall into that. Is, uh, uh, if, yeah. if they're operated, it depends on who owns the school bus because if the school owns it as part of the city and then or part of the county or whoever owns the school and that gets to be a little more challenging mm -hmm. but if it's operated by a third party you know my ex my understanding is yes but again i'm not an accountant and yeah I, yeah i understand i would yeah. i would encourage if you have contacts that might be interested i would encourage them to talk to them about that and have them look into that because yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of money 40 grand is <laughs> is a lot of money <laughs> right right <laughs> All right, so when the bill was signed into law, it immediately took effect. And when I say immediately took effect, it changed the law. 
what happened is, is that if you bought a, after the date it went into effect, if you bought a Kia EV6, which is not made in the United States, or you bought a Germany built uh, Volkswagen ID4, you would not get the credit on those vehicles. Okay. And this has had some interesting effects on the market. Um, nowadays, if you go look at, at new Volkswagen ID4s, there's loads of them sitting on the, sitting on the dealership lots, loads of them, but they're all made in Germany because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> nobody wants to buy the German ones because they don't get the tax credit. So the ones made in the U S are going very fast and the ones made in Germany are sitting around. Um, so yeah. And, and obviously nobody knew that that how that was going to play out or if that bill was going to get signed into law and you know how these things go okay so it has to be built in the united states so on the id4 specifically on the id4 you have to look at the vin number the first character of the vin number tells you if it's german made or us made okay um because the vin numbers are assigned based on where they were built okay so it's fairly simple to find out you just look at the vin number first digits number made in the us First digits, I believe a W, which is made in Germany. So it's quick enough once you see the VIN number to know what you're buying, but you know, you've got to be aware of that for those vehicles that are assembled in both places. I have a link that actually has a list of all the electric vehicles that are made exclusively in the United States. So you can just go buy one of those, you don't worry about what VIN number it is. And then it also has an exclusion or a, a footnote that says, by the way, if you know if it's not on this list, you have to check the VIN, right? And that basically is the ID for. But unfortunately for the folks buying Kias and um, Hyundais, they're not being made in the United States. So they no longer get the $7,500 tax credit. Um, and that probably messed up some people's plans and that's unfortunate. Okay, uh, income limits, like I said before, they're much higher. Uh, again, MAGI, plan accordingly. Um, again, you can see the numbers on the screen, I assume. So yeah, I mean, it's not unreasonable, right? That's a decent amount of money. Okay, uh, now we're getting into the challenging parts. <laughs> this is probably one of the most difficult things to understand. So right now in 2022, all North America assembled vehicles get the credit, okay? Very simple. It makes it one detail harder because you have to understand if it's North America or made elsewhere. And if it's North America, then you're fine. If it's made elsewhere, you don't get it, right? Starting next year, in other words, in you know six weeks or whatever, five weeks or whatever's left, it gets more complicated. <laughs> we still have the North America requirement, okay? So anything may have, everything has to be made in North America. And then there's, an, there's two additional requirements, each of which drives half of the $7,500. So if the vehicle only meets one or the other, you only get $3,750. If it meets both, then you get the full 7,500, okay. So what are those requirements? The requirements are that the battery materials have to be sourced from North America or a free trade agreement country. This is very specific so that other countries are incentivized to become free trade agreement countries, I'm sure. And that's the battery materials themselves, the lithium, the nickel, all of that. And I assume the copper wire and the aluminum or steel or whatever the battery case is made out of. I don't know. There are the law, of course, doesn't go into the details as to what exactly the battery is considered as far as materials. Is the steel of the battery case included in that? I don't know. I'm sure the manufacturers will argue that, of course, um, that it is whatever. But the gist here is it has to be. And each year it goes up. For the first year, 40% of the material has to be. North America or free trade agreement countries. Okay. Um, now, interesting point about this for anybody who complains to you and says, well, the batteries aren't, you know, just get thrown in the landfill or whatever. Ah, under the law, recycled batteries count. So at to your 40%. So if you know you've got a big stream of recycled batteries coming through, say Chevrolet and batteries they've taken out of the Chevy Bolts over the last year and a half or whatever it's been now. Um, that's a pretty big stream of volume of material, like physical material. And with that, they could eat, I would imagine they could easily meet the 40% for at least one or possibly even two lines of vehicles. Uh, so to me, Chevy's got an excellent opportunity to recycle all of those batteries and put them back into the stream for their new vehicles that are going to be selling next year and hit that 40% number for all of their 
uh, recite for all the materials just using recycled. They won't even have to necessarily source stuff in the country, except for the recycled. And of course, those originally weren't, none of the materials were originally necessarily sourced here. Okay, but it doesn't matter because it's recycled. So it's a big incentive to recycle your batteries coming out of the field, which is fantastic. Okay, the other half of the credit, and again, this is the same thing. It's gotta be 40%, 50%, each year it goes up. So every year we force the manufacturers to meet a higher standard which of course is driving more work into our country to drive more jobs, right? That's what this, you know, this is very much a jobs act. <laughs> As you'd expect from the Democrats, they very much want to drive actual jobs, manufacturing jobs back in the United States. I'm all for that personally, so um, this is good. Okay, uh, the other half of the credit is the components. So the value of the components, uh, you know, so this is a little more, neither of these are particularly easy to explain, I guess, ultimately. But if you think about like what costs money in the battery, like the value of the battery cells is probably the majority of it. It's a lot of the money, right? So, you know, you've got the content requirement and then you got the, the value requirement. And so that way, you know, if you used a bunch of low value content, like the case, and the aluminum or steel case and the copper wire and all that kind of stuff to meet your 40% of your material requirement, but it didn't hit the value number, right? Then this is a way of triggering that to happen to make sure that both things are done here. That basically we're trying to lock everything in where we prevent people from doing, bending the rules or maybe not bending, but abusing the rules as they may be to achieve the goal, okay? Of getting these tax credits. All right, does that make sense? Cause this is very confusing and I apologize for that. Anybody have any questions about that before we move on? Hey, you heard of it? hey, go ahead. Go ahead. You go, Bruce. I thought, um, is, is the government going to be simplifying this at some point? No. Did I hear that? No, my only assumption no. is, is that at some point, just like the fueleconomy.gov website has a list of what tax credit every vehicle qualifies for, I'm assuming come January 1st or something, we're going to have a website where we right. can go look up every single car and see what does it qualify for, right? And mm -hmm. This is the US government, so it may not be available on January 1st. It might be available on January 31st. Who knows? But we'll, at some point in the or new year, I would assume, we will see a website that has that information. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I looked around to see if it was published yet. It is not yet published. Uh, the best we can hope for is that it's published before the beginning of the year, and we'll read it and, and run with it. I honestly don't know how many car companies are going to meet these requirements. So I can't, I can't even guess. Like I said, Chevy, I've got a reasonably good guess. I think Tesla probably meets at least half of it because they assemble stuff here. They assemble batteries in Texas and California or Nevada, actually. You know, they do a lot of assembly work here. So I think those two will probably meet it. I'm not sure about anyone else because I just don't have enough insight into their manufacturing agreements and so forth. But a lot of other companies have put battery assembly plants in the United States or have agreements to do so in the near future. Um, I'm sure they're all scrambling to meet that. But anyway, okay. Uh, sorry, you had another, there's another question in the room? Uh, yes, uh, Jill, I think you probably answered some of uh, my questions. I assume by January, each of the car, the, the car manufacturer or whatever companies, they will put information out there to let the consumer know whether their car or whichever model will be qualified or not. Because as, as a consumer, how do we know? I mean, right. this is quite complicated. It, it really discourages it's, to it's me. It's extremely complicated. I understand. And I, my expectation is, is it'll be a U.S. government website, not, not the car manufacturers. I um, see. That's my expectation. Okay. That's what it is right now for the tax credits for, because remember on the old tech, not currently, but up until this law was signed, we had to know it because the tax credits used to be based on the battery capacity, right? So you had to have so much battery capacity. So the web, the fueleconomy.gov website had a list, a giant list of every electric vehicle made. And if what it's basically what its credit was, tax credit was, and then also when it hit its phase out period, because once they hit 200,000 cars, then it started this quarter by quarter phase out. <laughs> so it also was kind of complicated, but not complicated to this level, right? Mm -hmm. um, so no, I'm, I'm fully expecting the US government to do that. I'm not expecting the manufacturer. I wouldn't necessarily, if the manufacturers have 
some standardized form that they publish and it and it's you know uh, then i would trust it but if it's just i wouldn't trust a car dealer to tell me this let me put it to you that way if i walk into a car dealer and they tell me that their car complies with both of these requirements i will ask to see further information <laughs> <laughs> but my expectation is the U.S. government will have some, because ultimately the U.S. government is responsible for the implementation of this plan, mm -hmm. as complex as it is. So they will have to, at the end, they'll have to audit it to some degree, um, right? Because if somebody's cheating the system and saying they used a bunch of recycled material and they didn't, right, or something like that, then, you know, they could get slapped later by the government saying hey you defrauded us right uh, I, so that to me there's probably a lot involved here i don't but i'm, I'm hoping the u.s government steps in and it does the right thing and puts up a website with all the stuff on it just like they did with the other tax credits that's my that's what i'm hoping for um they have put up a list for current of vehicles that qualify now under the 2022 plan you know so that's a good step in the right direction assuming they follow a similar strategy we're in business but yes i agree with you it's extremely complex there's no way that i could possibly know this just based on i mean you can stand there and look at the window sticker but that won't tell you enough granularity the window sticker covers like content of material but it doesn't cover content of the battery material this is specifically about the battery so maybe it'll be added to the window sticker maybe there'll be a requirement made in the next few weeks to force them to put this information on the window sticker allowing us to verify it ourselves don't know. Okay, thank you. That, but yeah, that's the sort of, you're absolutely right. The implementation details are a pain. And I like what this law is trying to do. I, I agree with where it's going, but it stinks for those of us who have to try to figure it out, understand it, and use it, utilize it, because it's a, you know, hopefully all of us. <laughs> that's a real bugger. Um, yeah, I agree with you, though. I, and I'm hoping they make it simple. The bad news is if you want my, the worst case scenario is that the manufacturer has to change mid-year and you get into the exact same situation you're in now where you have to like go look up a VIN number, but now instead of seeing what country it's made in, you have to actually figure out where it was made in the series of production or some crazy thing. I have no idea. Um, so barring putting it on the window sticker, you know, content of battery is this much and value is this much. I don't know if anybody's looked at the window sticker lately, but that stuff's on there for the whole car, just not for the battery. <laughs> Okay, anyway, any other questions on that topic? I know it's complicated, I'm sorry. All right, but hopefully you guys understand generally what they're trying to get at. Uh, let's move on here. Okay, <laughs> okay, yes. Um, in 20, So basically the dealers can register, like I said before, dealers can register. Um, so in 2024, they can issue credits at point of sale. So you don't have to wait until the tax credit, you know, come tax time the next year. All right, so hopefully that is that clear to everyone. So basically, you starting twenty because a lot of people were talking about it. A lot of politicians were talking about it on the news and stuff. But the reality is that doesn't start until twenty twenty four. Not it's not available this year or not, or even twenty twenty three. Okay, there are MSRP limits. MSRP. So the manufacturer suggests a retail price. This is not the price you pay at the dealership. You cannot negotiate an eighty one thousand dollar vehicle down to seventy nine to get the credit. It is based on the MSRP. So you look at the window sticker, window sticker, or look at the you know, manufacturer website, and you can see what hits this $80,000 mark for vans, SUVs, and pickups, and for other, i.e. sedans, 55,000, okay? So, you know, if you're looking at a high-end Rivian, you're probably not getting it, but if you look at one of the, you know, the cheapest Rivians, I don't know if there's a Rivian under 80,000 anymore, but if there is, then it will qualify, right? Um, but again, MSRP, fairly straightforward to understand, but if it's over that, these numbers, then there's no, you don't have to worry about where the battery is made. Let's just put it that way. Okay. So, and we talked about the, where, you know, basically the law changed effect on 20 in the middle of the year here. And I didn't really go cover this, but basically I'm trying to cover this now. So even though the law changed, changed to allow Tesla and Chevy to get the credit, if they don't get the credit this year, they have to wait until next year when the new battery content laws go into place. That's when they get the credit. So you can't go get the $7,500 on the Tesla or a Chevy. Um, that's not available until next year. Um, and again, that's, it's this weird inter interim period. 
Uh, and some people were confused about that early on. Is there everybody clear on that? Basically, even though the Chevy and the Tesla were phased out, you still can't get it now, even though the law has changed. Okay. We're all good. All right. Okay. So, right. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, or very much alluded to, meeting the qualifications for battery content and battery man location and manufacturing could actually be a challenge. We don't know how it'll turn out. I'm optimistic that some will meet it. I don't know how many, and I don't know for how much. Okay, um, good news. This is definitely going to accelerate battery production in the United States. Um, you know, battery production, materials, mining, processing, all of that stuff is going to get accelerated here in the United States uh, and North America and our free trade partners and so forth. The other thing I noticed reading through this bill and having read through CJA is how similar it is that the, the Inflation Reduction Act very much takes things out of CJA. Um, like the used car section is very similar. <laughs> it doesn't have the exact same language, but the parameters and the way it works are very similar. Um, so I guess what I could say is that Illinois very much led the way on this. Um, and I'm proud of our state and you know, honestly of this group for helping with that. Okay. Uh, recycle materials count, as I mentioned earlier, battery recycling is going to become a big business and everything will get recycled because they need every last ounce of it to help meet their numbers, right? To keep that 40, 50, 60, because remember it keeps going up every year um, and it goes up 10% every year. So they need that recycling to help make those numbers. Um, so nothing will get wasted, all right? And, and traditionally battery recycling, when done, when done previously, because it was relatively low volume, they would burn off the lithium and then just take whatever um, metal came out of it, which was usually nickel, you know, magnesium, cobalt, right? Because they don't burn. Well, not not at reasonable temperatures anyway. So that that was the old way, but now that lithium will become valuable because that's a big cost and it's really going to help them meet their numbers. Okay, so that's that. Um, oh, yes, charging corridors. That's where we're going next. Okay, so this gets into how is that charging infrastructure build out have it happening. So what they're looking to do, so charging corridors are basically highways, but not every highway is a charging corridor. Every highway is a highway, but not every highway is a charging corridor. Every 50 miles and less than one mile from the highway, which I love because I've driven three, four, five miles off the highway to get charging, and it kind of stinks because you're stuck in traffic trying to get to the Walmart. Everybody else is trying to get to Walmart because they're shopping. It can be a drag. So close to the highway is fantastic. Um, 50 miles is great. If one of them's down, it's no big deal. You can go on to the next one, especially if you know in advance. Um, An NEVI, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure, you may see that acronym in the future. So just pay attention to that. And NEVI, that's what it means. All right. So that's charging quarters. We're gonna, I'm going to show you a picture. Um, so the red lines are not currently charging quarters. So 88, 290, and then this big long chunk of 72 over here. Those are not deemed charging corridors for this purpose. And I'm zooming in on the Chicagoland area for you to get a little better picture. Um, the dots, the, all these various dots are various types of charging stations that exist already on these corridors. Uh, so you can you know, expect to see that. I mean, those dots will obviously increase over time, but uh, yeah. Okay. And they are undesignated. Like I said, 88 and 72 are undesignated. So they're, they're, the state recognizes their corridors but they're not designated for the federal money. Okay, and that's the link to the actual thing. Okay, so, yep. So is there a reason why those two were left out? I don't know what that reason is. Uh, I assume because they don't have enough traffic of some type uh, to get the money. You know, we probably only had so much money and if that's what they felt like they could cover with it is my guess. And they felt like these were the best trade-offs. And yeah, I kind of agree with them because the reason, one of the big reasons why, uh, because if you look at all the highways that meet up with highways in other states, those are the ones that got designated. Uh, let me go back one. So like, if you look, all the green lines go out of state and the red lines, mm -hmm. this one goes out of state, but it's not a highway on the other side, I don't believe, because I, re I don't recall for sure, but I don't think 72 stays 72 once it gets out of Illinois. But all the other ones, and that's 24 down there. It does go out of the state, but it's fairly lightly traveled by comparison, you know. But yes, it's a, I don't know the reason, but I, I know they picked the highest traffic routes 
are the ones that are most used. And then these one fell out. And I'm just telling you, so you know, if you travel these routes a lot, um, then it's something to, you know, make us think about, right? <laughs> yeah. I-88 is the most significant to me. Um, you know, that that is pretty significant to me. You've got I-80 you can use, right? You can go down to I-80 and go out. That's a pretty, pretty good chunk out of your way, but it is an option. Um, a lot of cars can make it if you're starting out in Naperville. Some cars can actually make it out of the state or make it to Davenport to charge. I actually did it. I left my house in Crystal Lake way up in the corner up here and drove to Davenport without stopping to charge. So, you know, that's not beyond possible. But yeah, uh, it kind of stinks. I'm not a fan, but like I said, pick our battles, I guess. Any other thoughts about uh, questions? I, I'm basically done here. Any other questions or thoughts? Let's We can hash it out and talk about I it. I think they also took into account under-resourced areas, the over-resourced areas like kind of 88, this is a high income area, quote. They probably looked at that and said, mm, you know, let's put the money towards areas that are more under-resourced. And like 80 can, is like across the United States, you know, you take 80 left, east and west, and it, it'll link up with other corridors, I think, uh, as you go east and west. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely right. 88 starts in Chicago and ends in Davenport. <laughs> so, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely not as concerning. Yeah. Yes, Bill. Uh, Jeff, uh, the battery recycling, uh, does this... Uh, uh, also pertain to the D's and the triple A's and? Uh, no, because it's the wrong, those aren't the right kinds of materials. So those are okay. like alkaline batteries, so they wouldn't fit into that type of material. Okay. You need different materials than those have in them. I, I was under the impression that, um, that the recycled ones were, had a different, con, a different configuration. That, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about like your flashlight batteries or whatever, yeah, they those just they're the wrong materials in them. Theoretically, if there was something in there they needed, they could recycle them into it. Yeah, because my understanding is it's my rate recollection of reading the law isn't doesn't make it specific that it has to come from other electric car batteries. It just has to be recycled materials. So in you know they could recycle other like aircraft engine parts to get nickel, <laughs> which is fine as far as I recall. I. I I don't recall it saying anything about being EV battery specific, uh, but some of these materials don't really exist in high volume in other places like lithium. It doesn't exist in high volume in other places. So you're, you're getting that from a battery if you're getting it. Okay, thank you. No, no problem. So Jeff, if we were to snapshot today where batteries come from, <laughs> where, where, what, what, what would the answer be or what would you suppose? Uh, so if we're talking materials, um, it's it's a oh and somebody asked what's happening to 294 that's it's not considered a corridor it's just a local bypass route so i don't think it's considered a corridor at all by the state of illinois um but it has plenty of charging if you look at that map you'll see charging stations all around 294 anyway okay um where are materials come from well as far as the material raw materials themselves a lot of lithium comes from elsewhere outside of those free trade agreement places Nickel is mined heavily in Canada and in Africa. And I think Russia does some nickel. Uh, manganese, I don't remember off the top of my head who's mining manganese. Uh, it's a fairly small part of the battery. And it's to my, to my recollection, it's not particularly hard to come by. Uh, cobalt is the other big one in NMC batteries, which are like what's in the car behind me. Uh, cobalt is, as I recall, mined in Africa. Uh, so all of these things, or some of them will end up, there are, there are repositories of a lot of these metals here in the States. It's just not been previously economical to do it here, right? So this law is obviously <laughs> trying to change that, mm -hmm. forcing these people to mine these things here. Lithium, there's a lot of lithium here. It's not in forms that have traditionally been mined. Uh, there is some here, but there's all, uh, as I'm trying to think where all the, lit yeah, I can't remember where all the lithium comes from, but it's not here. Uh, a lot of the materials are mined in one place, transported to another country to be refined, i.e. China in a lot of cases. 
Okay. Uh, so you get some of that going on. And then, of course, China likes to make the cells because they like that sort of thing. Um, what's the build out for the charging stations? I'm trying to remember. Bruce, do you remember what the build out time frame on the charging stations is under this uh, act? Is it two years or something? I don't remember, but it's probably in that time frame. It's fairly quick. This is not something that's going to drag on for a decade or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is a fairly quick thing. Um, I think the I think the biggest concern that I have is who's going to manage them after they get installed. So that's got to be worked out <laughs> and paid for. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, and and uh, I would like it to see, you know, not a lot of corruption in that process, shall we say? But um, we all know how this mm -hmm. works. Um, yeah. There, there's reason why our governors go to jail on a regular basis around here. <laughs> Is that, is that going to be the responsibility of the utility utility company? It won't necessarily be the responsibility of the utility company because it's whoever wins the contract. It'll be a open to con open bid, I assume. Mm -hmm. A bunch of people submit bids. Somebody's going to win. And when they win, they will have that job to put those stations in. And hopefully there's maintenance agreements as part of that contract. Um, hopefully we're smart about creating those contracts where they have a 10 or 20 year maintenance agreement as part of them and we don't have these companies fold up and go under and the stations get turned off. Uh, so I'm optimistic because these are heavily used routes and there's gonna be a lot of stations on them. So, you know, I'm thinking, I would imagine that electric, I hope that Electrify America wins a lot of them, but I also know that, you know, other people will try to do it and there may be bags of cash handed around and we all know how that ends. So we'll see how it goes for us. All right. One more, one more question, and then we'll move along. Any, any other questions by anyone? Sure, Jeff. I'll, 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 I'll ask another one on, on, on the materials uh, for the battery. For the forty person number, is that, uh, is that the amount of material you can recycle, or is that the amount of material which has to be like sourced from North America or from the free trade country? Is that, is that what that number is? So it's both. Um, okay. You can get your 40% from either recycling or you can get it through, um, or you can get it from uh, raw material, new raw materials you've gotten from North America. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. And you could be a mix of both, right? So you can get 20% mm -hmm. of it from one and 20% of the other or so forth. So it, it's just a matter of making those numbers add up for you, for the company, for the manufacturer. And I put yeah. all the links in. And the, the fueleconomy.gov is the one that I was referring to in the old days. So like that's the old one. If you scroll down that list, you'll see all the electric cars that ever qualified for a tax rebate and how much they qualify for, right? So I'm expecting, I'm hoping that we have a similar list published <laughs> in 2023 and that it has some similar type thing. It shows you how much it qualifies for and if there's any conditions and so forth. That's what I'm hoping for. I, I, this is, to me, the standard of what they should meet. And I hope to see it before the end of this year, but I'm not optimistic that all the manufacturers will be able to answer all those questions before the end of the year, but maybe they will be able to. I don't know. Um, so it'll be interesting. But yeah, I, that's what I'm expecting to see. Okay. And then the other links are for the Illinois or the, the list of um, you know, vehicles there. If you want to look at them all, uh, yeah. And the list of vehicles also tells you if the manufacturer sells caps, but met as such, it won't qualify for the 7,500 this year in 2022 this year. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeff. I know we, uh, I'll speak for everyone. I appreciate your deep knowledge and your um, enthusiasm too. You are clearly enthusiastic about this topic. And uh, it, I, I know I learned a lot, and hopefully others did too. And maybe as this develops sometime in next year, maybe we ask you to come back and just kind of give us an update on this, you know, on what uh, really has happened since um, <laughs> so much has to be done in order for this to be done. <laughs> sure, absolutely. So. And I might be able to, you know, in the next year, I'll probably be able to give you an update if you're interested on all of the various tax credits around heating and cooling and new appliances and. Yeah, cool. windows and all of that and there there's a lot of money in the inflation reduction act for all of those things heat pumps yep. and everything else and i have one other if you don't mind me taking a second um yeah, you ahead. guys have done such a great job in a lot of areas um i talked about it in the fba newsletter um, i've come to the realization that the smartest thing we can possibly do is install charging at every workplace char parking spot or at least as many of them we possibly can 
um, how we go about that, but I know you guys are extremely active uh, because it enables everyone to charge and enables everyone to charge when the sun is shining, <laughs> right? For most people work at an office or work at a place during the day. And if there's spots to plug in their car, then they can consume the energy right off of the solar panels. Okay. And if, especially if those, and you guys being Naperville, you have your own utility. If those stations are centrally managed, Naperville can set that current level across all those stations to the appropriate amount to consume that solar to keep themselves at a neutral point. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that is something that I have, have come to the realization is extremely important. Um, probably one of the only ways we're going to be uh, those two key items, having it be managed by the utility or, you know, somebody who's directly contacting the utility and workplace where people are plugged in during the day um, to allow us to consume all the solar without having to pass that solar energy through a battery pack. So that's, to me, you know, I think it's probably one of the more important things. Okay. Okay. We are working on things similar to that. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into our various co uh, committee reports. So, um, so you're welcome to stay with us, Jeff, or you can drop off if you like. But thank you so much again for joining us this month. We appreciate it. No problem. Happy to help. All right. All right.